Good morning, everybody, and a very warm, warm being the operative word, welcome uh, to the Institute for Government this morning uh, for this In Conversation event with Sir John Thompson, the Chief Executive of the Financial Reporting Council. I'm Matthew Gill. Um, before we start, just some brief um, housekeeping arrangements. We will be tweeting uh, from IFG events using the hashtag IFG regulation. Please do follow and tweet along. And if you're watching online, please send in your questions as early as you like. Uh, if you give your name and where you're viewing from, it's always great to see. And you can post your questions in the, on the panel to the right of your screen. Uh, for those in the room, there'll be a microphone roving during the Q&A portion of this event. And do please try and keep questions on the subject of financial reporting and regulation, uh, which is what John's here to talk to us uh, about. As Chief Executive of the Financial Reporting Council, Sir John Thompson has led the regulation of UK audit and actuarial work, corporate reporting and corporate governance through a period of significant change. He's previously been CEO of HMRC and Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Defence. And before that, John had a long financial career in several government departments. He's now been appointed the Chair of High Speed 2, delivering the biggest infrastructure project in Europe. So John is very closely acquainted with finance, regulation and leading change in our key institutions. So before we begin our conversation, please welcome him to say a few words both about the role of the FRC and his experience of being a regulator. John. Well, uh, thanks very much for that introduction. I had no idea what you were going to say and it's really nice to be back here at the IFG. I think the last time I came here was to talk about the operational delivery profession and how critical it was for the delivery of public services. Thanks for the kind invitation to come and reflect on almost four years as Chief Exec of the FRC. I'm planning to talk about five connected things. First of all, how does light touch regulation work when the system that you're regulating undoubtedly will have some failure at some point? It might be a bit odd to talk about failure, but I think it's important that we recognise it. Secondly, what are the levers you've got over and above legislation to make a difference? How can you use the ecosystem around you to drive change uh, and then how much regulation is enough a kind of rather interesting question I think sorry to be slightly dull about it you know how much is enough and I'll explain why I'm interested in that and then how have you have I managed to turn around an organization that was described as a ramshackle house by Sir John Kingman formerly of the Treasury now the chairman of legal and general and then we can turn to some questions um, as was said, uh, just in case you don't know anything about the Financial Reporting Council, we're one of the UK's corporate regulators. We regulate listed companies, how they govern themselves, how they report to their stakeholders, how they do their annual reports, all that kind of thing. And we are the keepers of the UK Corporate Governance Code. We also regulate investors in terms of how they engage with corporate life and use their influence as the owners of the, of the, of the company. And we regulate a range of professions, auditors, accountants, actuaries, and the professional firms that they work for and the institutions that they train for. So we regulate the ICAW, ACCA, SIPFA, and so on, but we also regulate the big four uh, and all of those uh, institutions too. It's a remit that's continued to grow over quite a long time. Let me start by talking about failure which might be a slightly odd place to start, but let me try and explain. We regulate about 1,900 companies. Most of those are publicly listed on the stock exchange. And at any point, uh, the vast majority of these companies actually are performing well, they're acting responsibly, and they're being transparent. That's our view. You can see our annual reports on corporate governance and corporate reporting, and it says that. But they won't all be doing that. Even if the vast majority are performing well, and behaving well, there will always be a small minority who are struggling, they don't want to be accountable, their business model is failing, they're not interested in transparency. Those are sort of the, some of the common themes. And in extremists, some of these companies will, of course, fail completely. Uh, see Carillion, Thomas Cook, Patisserie Valerie, I could go on, yeah. What happens when a major company fails? Well, there are cries of, uh, what were they doing? Where were the auditors? Why didn't the regulators spot this and deal with it? Parliamentarians and the media, rightly, both react to failure in broadly the same terms. Right? How is this allowed to happen? Who's responsible? How do we prevent this from happening? Again, perfectly normal uh, reaction, not unreasonable in any case, especially in Carillion's case, for example. But equally, ministers, and you'll hear this quite a lot, are quite drawn to what they call light-touch regulation. 
Now, that sounds fine. Now, I assume what light touch regulation is, is it's a risk-based, proportionate regulatory system, one where the regulator has the ability to differentiate their intervention in the system on the basis of information intelligence and so on. But when failure occurs, ministers and parliamentarians often reach for a very blunt instrument, which is legislative change. They want to raise standards for all of the entities in the system and to protect people and companies and stakeholders and so on. I, I understand that, right? But raising standards for all doesn't solve the problem of the exceptions, right? Responsible companies will comply because they're responsible. And sometimes that involves them spending money and, and so on and so forth, right? But the companies that need to change are much less likely to actually change. So what, in my opinion, is needed is not change the entire system, but to deal with the exceptions to that system. But that means that you have to design a regulatory system around uh, giving regulators the power to deal with that exceptions. Now, this is where the problem comes. A more invasive highly targeted intervention by a regulator can achieve significantly more than changing the entire system, in my opinion, right? Such a system would be light touch for the vast majority of the entities in the regulated system, but the very specific and targeted intervention on the exceptions would not feel like light touch, right? That means giving powers to regulators to intervene more, possibly much more with the exceptions, and to act responsibly when doing so. And of course, there's a quite interesting question there about who's really making the decision about intervening. Is it ministers or is it the regulator? But I would urge civil servants who are trying to design a regulatory system to think very carefully about the choice between raising standards for all or having a more powerful regulator with invasive powers. Which takes me to the second question, what levers do you have to affect change? Now, let's be really clear. Regulators have significant power. They have power granted to them by parliament, and statutory backing is an incredibly useful tool. You can essentially tell those who are regulated to do something. In our case, the government has yet to pass some primary legislation that would change the very nature of the FRC to create the new corporate regulator recommended to it twice now by independent reviews, but I'm sure that they will get on with it at some point when parliamentary time allows. But I want to observe something else about being a regulator. It isn't all about the power you have and telling people, companies, regulated entities, what they have to do. There are a lot more levers that are available to you as a regulator, and I'm going to talk a bit briefly about three. The first is simply negotiation, actually sitting down with whoever you're regulating and sharing what you're trying to achieve and how you might be able, uh, how they might be able to help, right? So if you take an example for us, We've been trying to deliver higher audit quality with the big four audit firms. We have no legislative power to act to ask them to separate their audit practice from the rest of the firm. That was recommended by the Competition and Market Authority to the government, but it hasn't gone through Parliament. So what we've done is sit back down by negotiation, actually, and move to all of the big four, putting their audit practice at arm's length from the rest of the firm, not legally separated at all, and we did that through effective negotiation. Actually, we had a shared goal of higher quality, and using a principle-based framework, they've all changed. I think they all now recognize that it's made a difference to helping them to improve audit quality, which is the key regulatory goal. Secondly, how could you promote and support best practice? In our field, there are many, many examples of best practice, and we have deliberately increased the number and range of products that we publish best practice guides on, but we're not the only organization that would observe about corporate life. We're not the only organization that's writing best practice on corporate governance or risk management or reporting on your carbon footprint or whatever people are interested in. So, and this is very simple, why would you not simply promote the best practice guides of other organizations, right? And we've done that on a number of occasions in the last three years. We don't have to invent the wheel here. We can support other people who've done all the work. And thirdly, and possibly most controversially, I want to advance to you that the use of media and public information is an unbelievably powerful tool to bring about change. Our experience is that most companies want to be seen to be responsible. They definitely don't want to be quoted by the regulator as being poor performing or non-compliant. I can tell you that. Um, 
The reputation of any organisation or individual is generally very important to them. And if you begin to say, oh, hang on a minute, I don't think you're really performing and I'm going to say that in public, uh, you know, it generally gets quite an interesting reaction. The power of information you publish, how you use the media to leave a change should never be underestimated. So thirdly, what about this kind of wider system uh, around you? It struck me at HMRC that tax uh, generally results from some economic activity or event, doesn't it? You hire somebody to work for you, you buy a house, you sell a house, whatever, and in that event, some tax arises. Now, once we realise that at HMRC, you can see that there's a much bigger picture of what's happening around you and how does the tax system sort of plug into that. Same goes for the FRC. Investors are interested in well-run, profitable companies, and through their power as shareholders, they can drive higher standards in the companies. They can drive more responsibility, be more transparent, higher standards of corporate governance, conduct, and so on. The same goes for stakeholders, suppliers, banks, pension fund holders, pensioners, communities, NGOs, trade unions. There's a vast range of stakeholders in corporate life. They can force change on companies. Take the example of disclosures about carbon emissions. That was brought about by stakeholders, largely, in our opinion. Companies have a place here, they can of course demand more from their auditors, or indeed more from engagement from their investors. And now in relation to their auditors, they can demand more to assure themselves about the quality of the external auditor, the quality of the corporate reporting, and so on. Auditors can put pressure on companies in the same way around. Their report, when it's published, can put significant pressure on a company. One would observe though, in the last 30 years, there's only ever been one listed company that's had a qualified audit report, and that was only uh, a few months back. So auditors are somewhat reluctant to do this, but they can make a significant difference to the way in which a company is run. And professional institutions themselves, the ICAW or, ACAS, or ICAS or CIMA or the ACCA or SIPFA or whatever, can make a significant difference by changing training and professional standards and continuous education and so on. And there are a wide range of others that make a difference here. The Institute of Internal Auditors or AMIC, the Risk Management uh, Alliance and so on, also raise standards by increasing best practice. If you see that system in its broader sense, then it seems to me that as the regulator, you can use these interconnections, this system around you to best effect for the benefit of all and delivering your goals. Which takes me to the rather interesting question about when is enough regulation enough. I, I have to say I find this question an interesting one and to, to preview it, I don't know what the answer is, right? Uh, but let me just have a reflection on it. Uh, look, as a regulator, you need to check that what you expect the regulator community to do, they are actually doing. You know, that's straightforward compliance checking. Anyone can understand that, can't they, right? But you have to take a risk-based and a proportionate approach, also a fairly sensible way of doing it. And let's be clear, we are not re-performing what regulated entities do. We're not reproducing the annual report and accounts. We're not re redoing the audit of something. What you're doing is checking that the regulated community is following a standard process and policy and complying with the standards. So when is enough compliance checking enough, right? Do you have to check every regulated entity? Well, I think the answer to that is no, because it would be ridiculous and unbelievably expensive if we checked absolutely everything that happened. So we do about 100, we, we check about 150 audits out of the 2,000 companies that we are interested in, that's about 7%, and we look at about 300 annual reports, or about 15%. Is that enough? Well, we think so, but I can't definitively say it's enough, or indeed too much, actually, might be the other way around. I can, I can justify the methodology, I think it's in line with the regulator's code, but I'm sort of left with the nagging feeling that if we did more, we'd probably find more. And if we found more, would that then help to change the system in the ways that I've described? Uh, but I don't know. And actually, our board's decided to sit down and have a think about, you know, well, is there a right answer to this question? We don't, we don't know if there is or there isn't. We're just sticking to where we are at the minute. Uh, finally, you asked me to say something about how you turn around a ramshackle house, which was the description given to the FRC by Sir John Kingman in a very credible uh, and well-respected report. I'm going to say this up front, I've said it to him before. He made 83 recommendations for change. I mean, he, he could have written 150 recommendations for change, frankly, and I talked to him about that, and he said, well, you know, once you've written 83 and said it's a ramshackle house, you sort of, you know, how much further do you need to write? But I just want to be clear, we haven't just changed 83 things. It's been significantly 
more to do about that. Now, I, you need to discount my obvious bias because I've been the chief executive for four years, but I think we're fundamentally a different organisation now than we were before, and I think there's plenty of commentary out there that says that we are. So what have been the key changes? So firstly, real clarity about what's the point of the FLC, what's the purpose? It's to serve the public interest by setting high standards of corporate governance and reporting and audit, and by holding to account those people who are responsible for delivering them. That's not exactly snappy, is it, right? But, but you know, it really resonates in the organisation about what it is that we're trying to do. And once you've got that, you can build away from that objectives and plans and programmes of work around clearly connecting to the purpose. If something doesn't contribute to that purpose, we stop doing it. We have stopped doing a range of different things. And then we reorganise ourselves into the very logical flow of what we do. We set standards, we, uh, we supervise compliance, and then we enforce if there are egregious breaches of the standards. That's the flow of the organisation. Everyone, therefore, is clear about how they connect to the purpose and how they contribute to the other functions. We've significantly changed the leadership. Look, let's not duck this issue. You need a senior leadership team that's completely on board with what it is that you're trying to do. Overall, I changed all members of the Exco bar one and pretty much half the level below that. We seriously thought through what capacity and capability we need to need. It's a kind of phrase that most of you, I guess, will be familiar with. Not only have we expanded the number of people by more than double in the last four years, but we've established in completely new functions like actuarial uh, monitoring or local government audit recently for, for DLUC. We've promoted the best, we've recruited some superb people, and the strength and depth of our organisation is now so significant, I think, that some of our people are now globally recognised as leaders in their field. We deliberately and consciously set out to forge alliances and partnerships, echoing some of, the, some of what I said earlier. We respectfully listen, we learn, we debate, we discuss with others to build better, smarter regulation. People feel more listened to. They're not necessarily that we agree with them, but at least there's a dialogue and a debate and a discussion about we, we want to achieve these goals. How do we do that? How do you, how's it got an impact on you? And some have the opportunity to contribute, sometimes significantly. I could certainly think of some standards that we've developed where we've co-created them with the regulated community. And look, lastly, but by no means least, but I left it to the end, we think and consciously act in the wider public interest. It's not just about the perspective of shareholders in corporate life. It's just as much about what a stakeholders think about corporate life. So I think overall we're fundamentally different from the organisation Sir John Kingman reviewed way back in 2018. Uh, is the journey finished? Well, frankly, not quite. I mean, there will be something for my successor to do. Specifically, we need primary legislation to scrap the FRC and create ARGA, the, reg the regulator that was recommended by both Sir John and then uh, subsequently uh, in a second review. And we need investors, secondly, we need investors to be more, more engaged in corporate life, in corporate culture, in corporate change. The majority of investors are slightly lazy. They don't really want to get involved in all of that. Some are very, very good, and they sign up to the, our stewardship code and move forward. But we need more investors to be engaged in corporate life because they can impact the way the companies run. But those two challenges are probably for my successor. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, John. <laughs> Thanks, John, for that really wide-ranging and interesting um, in introduction for us. Um, I, I wanted to start by just discussing some of the comments you made sort of near in the first half of that, really, um, about the, um, the way in which you want to approach regulation. Uh, and what you describe as sort of a sort of light touch sounds like it's more it's more judgment based. It's more reliant on the regulator deciding when to intervene publicly or privately with with firms. Um, and I wonder what your thinking was about how the FRC can ensure that it's exercising that judgment fairly and proportionately when it does so. Huh. Uh. Well, let's just, let's just step back a bit. So, so, so our annual review of corporate governance and our annual review of corporate reporting of those 1,900 companies says standards are high, they've improved in the following areas, we'd like some further improvement. And you can broadly apply that judgment to a, about 95% of the companies that you're regulating. You can't apply it to all of them for the reasons that I said, because this is a system w which will fail and there are entities in it which will fail. So how do you sort of 
decide where you're going to intervene and how you're going to do it. So what's absolutely critical, and Kingman commented on this, was you know, the, the intelligence that you've got, the information that you've got in order to drive along a risk-based system. So we changed our um, audit quality reviews in 2021, I think it was. So we were doing uh, random sampling of audits. He said, well, hang on a minute, how does that work when we know that there's some, some corporates clearly have higher risk and some don't? We can talk about that if you want. So we, it's fundamentally about the information and the intelligence you've got and how you use that to drive risk-based intervention. Now, what that can mean is that you're reviewing one entity every single year because you think it's the highest possible risk, mm. but some entities never get reviewed. And we think that that's the right judgment, but it relies fundamentally on the quality of the information. So one of the functions we've had to significantly alter is the economic... Uh, statistics and research department to put it on a different plane to then drive the rest of the system in terms of the compliance work that you have to do. So that's the way we've gone about it. Um, it was, I think, a bit of a shock for some of our regulated community that they actually now got more attention mm -hmm. and some were very happy with the fact they got less, right? I mean, it's sort of pretty pro quo, right? Um, for those who got more, I mean, we sat down with them and said, well, we, th this is our rationale, this is why we think that you're high risk, therefore that's why we're, gonna, we're going to check it more. Um, and actually, they, they sort of broadly come around to that and say, well, hang on a minute, how can I reduce my risk assessment? Now, that's a really good question, because we can say, well, if you could change A, B, and C, or D, e, and F, actually, you'd f we'd, we'd feel like you were less of a risk, so you can also use the information to help them to develop and improve um, because they don't really want regulators, in my experience, they don't really want the regulators on your doorstep. So you can use it in multiple different ways, but what's been fundamental has been a really significant investment in economics, statistics, analysis and research. Mm. Thanks. And you, you, you alluded to um, sort of a ministerial interest in, in interventions in particular sort of directions. I mean, what you've described is, is, is very much sort of driven from within the FRC. How... How do you think you should be held to account by ministers or even parliament on these kinds of more judgment-based interventions? <laughs> well, having been a permanent secretary and appeared in front of 83, I think, select committees, I was sort of expecting that I might get an annual outing that said, you know, how are you doing? I have to say in four years, I've never appeared in front of parliament at all, which I think is kind of slightly mm. more unusual. Yeah. There's been quite a fluidity to the government, which I think hasn't really helped. I think I'm on my seventh Secretary of State in four years. So actually, you know, a new Secretary of State come in and they've got a bunch of things they need to do and they're all really important and we're sort of somewhere down the pecking order and you don't quite get round to engaging with the Secretary of State before they've moved on something else. So that's not helped either, I think. But I, I was kind of expecting I would be held to account, at least in some way, by ministers and also by Parliament. And that simply hasn't happened, which I think is interesting. Right. I mean, you know, I'm okay with that, but, but, but you know, who wouldn't be? So the offer is there. <laughs> the yeah. offer is there. I'm very happy to talk. But, you know, if, you know some Bayes, when Bayes was, you know, the single integrated department was, was vast, wasn't it? And it included some really critical national functions like energy security. Uh, I can understand why it's been broken into parts. Um, not that we were party to that in any way. I think the great strength of the current relationship, though, to, to be positive about it, is we are completely independent. There is never any ministerial interference that says, can't you go off and check company X? Mm -hmm. We have never had that conversation at all, which I think is good. It is, it is our system to regulate. There's a lot of conversation about policy framework, but not about the operation of that framework. It's about the, in the policy conversation, particularly because you're trying to develop towards a bill in order to bring around um, the recommendations from Kingman and Bryden. But, but it, you've got full op operational independence and no interference, which I think is quite good. But I was kind of expecting to be held to account by someone. And it's worth remembering, by the way, there was a, quite a long period when the board consisted of two people. So I, don't, I didn't have that either. So you can blame me if you like, but you know, it was an interesting 18 months when I had no ministerial steers, no ministerial contact, no parliamentary contact, and I had no board. Yeah. So it did feel like I was running a regular, almost on my own. Yeah, and that's, a, that's an issue on appointments then as well, isn't it? And trying to keep those going quickly. Yeah, let's not open up the box of appointments to boards. Mm -hmm. um, so look, you've described 
uh, you know, you've done a lot in the time you've been at, you've been at the FRC, but mm. um, one of the questions that's come up online as well is, why is it taking so long for the ARGA to be set up uh, and what's happening? Now, we know there's been delays to legislation, so I wonder if maybe you could, for, for, for those who aren't familiar, just sort of answer that question of where things stand. Okay. But also, um, uh, maybe it's worth reflecting on whether you've done so much that government isn't obliged <laughs> to make this a priority anymore? That could, it, have you done enough that it can muddle along now? Well, there's an interesting dilemma. You mean, you mean if I had sat for four years and not done anything, would it have, would it have mm. nudged our legislation further up? That's just not me at all, though, is it? Um, well, let's, let's just wind back. So there were 83 recommendations in Kingman. There were another 60-something in Bryden, and then there were a few from the Competition Marks Authority. I think 167 altogether or something like that. The vast majority of those, you, the FRC could progress. So you're left with a remainder where you do need some primary legislation in order to give ARGA, the proposed uh, subsequent regulator, the powers to intervene in some of the areas that I've talked about. So one of the, one of the things about the FRC, it's one of these great British compromises, right? Is you don't really have any primary legislation here. You can sort of work out exactly how this thing works broadly between you and the regulator community. And, you know, as long as everyone's kind of OK, then... That's the way it is. But that doesn't ever give you the power to say, um, I need you to change and here I'm telling you to do it, which is you know, how, how several other regulators do work because they've got that statutory backing. So there are some areas where we do need those powers in order to be able to take the ent some of the entities that we regulate and say to them, we're not going to be able to do this by negotiation. We can't do it in the Great British Compromise way that we're going to do it. You don't really want to go along with it. Uh, you're sort of immune to media on this thing, um, so I need the power to tell you to do it. Mm. Now, those are the, again, I want to re-emphasize, those are the exceptions, right? It's not the rule, the sy systemic rule, those are the exceptions. So you need the power to do that. You've got to put the, at some point, somebody's going to have to put this body on, on a statutory footing to fund it and be clear about what its powers are. So there is a, there's a sort of remainder that's necessary. Um, and in that remainder are some controversial powers. The, the, the top one, I think, the most controversial power that was proposed was, at the minute, as a regulator, let's use a specific example to bring it to life for you. So Carillion collapses. Uh, we do a review. We think, well, OK, there are some findings about Carillion, and there are some findings about KPMG, the auditors. We cannot take any action against the directors of that company unless they are qualified accountants which is relatively easy to dodge, because if I turn up and say, I'm going to take some regulatory action against you, you could say, fine, I resign as a member of, I'm not a qualified accountant anymore, you can't take any regulatory action, right? So what was proposed was that we should be allowed the power to decide whether all of the directors of the company um, had performed their duties, which are well set out in the Companies Act at the minute, um, but we can't currently do that. And that, that you know, so it might be the chairman of the audit committee uh, actually didn't carry out the functions that were expected in the company's act. We cannot, we cannot do anything about that. We have to rely on other regulators to do something about that. And that is quite a controversial power. And some, um, in the response to the government's consultation, some people were like, wow, you mean you're going to take action? You're going to basically, some of the allegations were, you're going to professionalise non-executive directors and they'll all have to be accountants. To, we're just like, that's just nonsense, right? I mean, that's not what we're suggesting. We're simply suggesting that those who are accountable for corporate collapse, there should be a method by which they can be held to account by the regulator, whether they're qualified accountants or not, right? Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't matter. And that is, I think, probably the most controversial power. And we can't do that by negotiation. Yeah. Because our regulatory processes, our enforcement can result in significant personal fines, hundreds of thousands of pounds, you know, you're thrown out of the relevant professional institute, the, the company itself is fined, and so, you know, you can't do that by negotiation. Would you like to be involved in the system, and if you're guilty, then, you know, I mean, obviously the answer is going to be no, so we, we do need to do it. Where are we? It's, for some time, it's been when parliamentary time allows, and parliamentary time has, has not allowed, and I think it's basically the answer you will get, because the government is very busy on a range of other things which it thinks is of higher priority. I can respect that. That's for ministers to decide. I'm not, all I can do is advocate for the change, 
we've been very clear we want the change, then it's for ministers at a different level to work out whether this is important enough to uh, make the cut. We await the King's speech. It sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? We await the King's speech in the autumn to see whether we made the cut uh, for the final session of this government. Thank you. I mean, another area I, you mentioned that um, the FRC kind of negotiates with others is, is internationally. Um, so I wondered if you might say a little bit about, um, you know, what the FRC does internationally to try and build global consensus around corporate accountability and what the, the limits to your national powers are in, in the context of international firms. So we, that's a good question. We, so the first thing we're saying is as a, as a regulator, if I look at my peers internationally, we have the widest remit of any of those. Most of them only focus on how our auditors doing in relation to delivering order quality. They're not involved in corporate life. Some, some of the responsibilities we have are either attached to the equivalent of the Financial Conduct Authority or they're attached to the relevant capital market in that particular jurisdiction, right? So our remit's very wide and the proposition is to make it even wider. So that's the first thing that's worth saying. But there are a range of global standards the UK has signed up to all of the, the global standards, so for example, international financial reporting or international audit standards or uh, ethical standards or so on and so forth. And then what we do is we take the international standard and then we generally, what we do is add to that a clarification about how it works in our capital market. So we've adopted the global standards and then we've, ad we've adapted, clarified, sometimes added to that global standard for the UK. Therefore, it's unbelievably important that you're involved in, that, in the global standard setting. We have people on pretty much every one of the global standards. The borders, there are about five that make a difference. The only one that we don't really have a representative on from the FRC is the IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. But all the others we do, and we spend a lot of time, uh, there's a dedicated unit that does this in our standard setting area, traveling the world, talking to people, influencing them, uh, chairing working groups, all that kind of stuff, so that the standard itself, which is coming forward, we're sort of signed up to before it even gets endorsed, and we think that's a sensible way of doing it. Um, I think we're quite influential. A lot of people come here and say, well, how do you do X, Y, and Z? But equally, there's, there's a lot for us to learn about how other jurisdictions approach corporate governance or corporate life or investor regulation or whatever. So just as much for us to learn as it is for us to contribute uh, the other way around. I think we've been reasonably successful in that, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll come to questions uh, shortly. Um, just one um, more to, to ask you before we do, which is sort of being reflected uh, in some of the points uh, that are coming up online as well, um, which is around the sort of conflicts of interest in the, in the audit market. You've talked about, by consensus, getting people to separate their audit and other, other businesses. Uh -huh. um, but I wonder, you know, obviously the market's very concentrated in the UK, particularly for, for audit. What more do you think needs to be done or could be done uh, to enhance the, the quality of audit and the, and the separation uh, within those organisations? So, it's not just the UK that's very concentrated in, it's con very concentrated globally. I mean, the big four is pretty much the big four everywhere you go. There's probably one exception to that that immediately comes to mind, which is France. There's a five mm. instead of a four, because you add on Mazar. Um, well, let's, let's just a step back. There are two reasons why audits generally fail an audit quality review. They're either, first of all, process errors. So the standard methodology that a firm uses hasn't been adopted on this audit. I mean, that's pretty straightforward for them to be able to sort out, we think. Um, or secondly, and most, more controversially, is, is, is judgments. So most people, f forgive me, most people think accounting is kind of quite scientific. You debit this and you credit that, right? And, you know, you add it all up. And if you've ever been subject to an audit of your expenses or something like this, you know, it's a transactional conversation is, has this happened and so on and so forth. But when you get to the board level, you have to apply a range of judgments over and above those transactions. Okay, so let's take a simple example. At the year end, I've got so much in, uh, in debtors. People owe me whatever they owe me, am I going to get it all or not? Am I going to get 100%? Well, no. So if I'm not going to get 100%, what's the judgment about how much am I going to get? 
So that's a judgment, right? But there are a wide range of other significant accounting judgments that need to apply. I mean, the bigger the company is, the more accounting judgments you get. That area where the company is itself saying, we judge 80% of debtors are going to come in. Um, I'm using a simple example, but there are a wide range of them. That judgment itself is based on some evidence, but you know, are the auditors challenging that judgment sufficiently or not? Because a lot of corporate failure revolves around these judgments, right? I'll give you a real example. Um, we did a review of a joint venture, two publicly listed companies, they have a joint venture, which is to build a bypass, I can't say where. Uh, it's to build a bypass, relatively straightforward. They sign a contract that says we're gonna build a bypass for N. They, they can't, unsurprisingly, they don't build the bypass for N, it runs over, it costs a lot more than N, and they enter into a legal dispute with the relevant public authority about said bypass. And you've got two different companies, okay? So I've got a legal dispute, and there's money involved in this. One company says, okay, we will decide, we judge that we'll be unsuccessful and we won't get any more revenue. The other one takes the completely reverse decision and says, no, no, we're definitely going to win. We're going to get 100% of the revenue. Both of those are allowed under the accounting standards, right? Nought or 100. They're both wrong. Being an old-fashioned accountant, I sort of like the prudent one because, you know, you can't do worse than zero. Can you? Yeah. Uh, you're probably going to get something. But the 100% is very aggressive, isn't it? It's saying, I'm confident enough to think, oh, I'm going to get all of this. I'm very aggressive. And the, the, the worst case, of course, was Enron where they pushed all of the accounting judgments to the absolute maximum. And therefore, when you add them all up, what you've got is a statement of accounts that's fundamentally quite different than what's really going on in the entity. Right? And then it collapses, and then everyone goes, what happened there? So this phrase about ag aggressive accounting is, is at the heart of it. Investors are very, very interested in what judgment are you making? Because I'm investing in your company. How transparent is that? And have the auditors challenged you about that? About that a judgment? It's a very, very interesting area. Sorry to be all accountant about it. But it is a, and that's the area where auditors generally fail. We think the compliance area is much more straightforward to work out. This judgment is, you know, it's tough for them. And it's, it's, and how do you evidence the fact and all that kind of stuff? So could they do more in that area? Yes. They probably could in terms of training and development and, and review and all that kind of stuff. I think, to be fair to all the four, they all have invested in an audit quality improvement plan. They're all getting on with it. Our annual results will come out in a couple of weeks. That will uh, not like can preempt what the numbers are, but that will, that will show for the fourth year in a row an increase in, the audit, in audit quality. They're all on the right track. I think they're all doing the right things. They're investing in all the right things. I mean, but it's a long slog from here to 95% of audits being in compliance with the standards. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's time to take a couple of questions from the uh, audience. If there's anybody in the room who would like to ask a question. Uh, uh, yes, the, the gentleman at the back. Pete. Hi, so uh, Peter Horn from Nice Group. Um, I, I've got one question to ask, which is, it's been quite a while in terms of regulators looking at the penalties that they have and the interventions that you can make. You can go back to the sort of mid-2000s and there was a McCrory review of penalties which recommended exactly what you were talking around in terms of being able to have a suite of interventions as a regulator. Given we've known this for some, quite some time, what's taking so long in kind of wider regulatory processes that means that we're not providing regulators with the tools they need to do the job? Well, for the powers, this is a good question, right? I mean, for the powers that we have now, not the powers we anticipate we would get as and when the government created Argo, actually it's pretty much in our own gift to decide on what fines are appropriate for, you know, the auditors or the audit partner and so on. And we've come under quite a bit of pressure to increase them quite significantly. Um, after... We have a scale of how do you work out what the fine is. And people generally don't react well to, um, hmm, I want to quote a specific, but I can't. Um, big four firm, multi-billion pound turnover, five million pound fine. Is that really going really to make a difference to make them think about it? 
And Kingman wrestled with this question and Dumpton came up with an answer. There is, a, there is a view that we ought to increase the fines to the point where you really would notice it if you really got a bad audit. Right? Um, and we, we continue to debate it internally. I think we should review our, our fine scales and the impact of those soon. Um, now I've got a full board and they've been in for a year. These are the kinds of bigger questions they can get into. Um, for powers to come, difficult to say, right? It's better not to engage in that. But in terms of the powers we got now, we, we could change it. And I think the board needs to contemplate that in its next uh, development phase so that people really do notice it. I would say on the individual level, by the way, uh, if an average partner of a big four probably earns, I don't know, 700 grand. So if I fine you 700 grand, you, you're definitely gonna feel it on an individual level. It's, it's the corporate level fines that, where the, where the question is, is it really enough to make people think about, mm. I don't really want to cross the regulator again and do a really bad audit. So I'm interested, this, but your question's a good one. It's, it's not finished is the answer. And we, we ought to do a review. Of course, I've sat in rooms like this where people go, oh, they're way too big, these fines. And you go, I'm not sure I agree with that. You know, I did. I did an event recently in the city where people go, oh, you know, you find us 25 million quid and we only got X, Y, or Z wrong. And I go, yeah, but the whole thing collapsed and it, the sh sh shareholders lost 1.8 billion pounds. There's a, view, a strong view out there that you're not being fined enough. And they go, oh, you know, uh, poor old me. You know, that's so, so much. Look, I mean, I've got a fairly controversial view, which I'll get out because I've nearly finished this job. Um, uh, so nobody can hold me to account for this. I think if you want to earn 700 grand a year, you ought to do a good job, right? You really, I mean, you, it's, I mean, you need to get some sense about the average person in this country earns 28 grand and you earn 700 grand. You are happy to do this job. You're being held to account for it. What's wrong with that, right? But I, I can tell you, I've sat in front of audit partners and go, oh, it's really terrible, whatever. And the worst case of which is, and this is on the public record, so I'll um, say it is, of course, the audit partner of Carillion famously saying that, well, it wasn't his fault because he wasn't there because he was picking up his Porsche, right? That was his defense in a tribunal. And most of us go, <laughs> what? So, you know, people get into interesting places in which their perception of the world is their perception of the world, and we've got a different view of the world. I think if you want to earn 30 times more than the average person in this country you, and you do a bad job and you're regulated, you get held to account for that. Well, that's the way it is, right? If it ends your career because it was so bad, but, you know, that's accountability. There's a slightly related question that's come in uh, on, on, online to this, which sort of links your current role uh, yeah. slightly to your, to your previous one. This is from Pete, but there's anonymous questions asking similar, similar points. Do you have any ideas on how to improve the provision of tax advice? So this would be accountants providing tax advice. Yeah, I do. Does this market need some, some form of reform? Of it? Yeah, I, I do. I think I, when I was at HMRC, it was my view that tax advisors ought to be a regulated community, and um, particularly for individuals. I mean, you could argue about corporates, but you know, if you're a high-earning individual and you, you know your money's not really your thing, footballer, right? So you've got high net worth individual, massive income. Unsurprisingly, they go to get some professional advice. The professional advisor gives them some advice. They get paid. It turns out in due course through some process that, le that the advice is bad, it goes sour, and the individual's left with the bill because it's about personal accountability. And the advisor, of course, has disappeared with the fee. Now, my, my, my strong view was that, that is a, that's a system that ought to be regulated. And the government did have a review of that. And we, uh, they asked me for my view of it. My view is that personal tax advice sh should be a regulated uh, profession. And it, um, that means there are consequences for it in terms of compliance checking and so on and so forth. Now, corporate tax advice, different area, right? Worth saying, because just in case there's any myths about this, the big four have almost entirely withdrawn from personal tax advice. So if you went back 
10 years, there would be schemes that they would sell you to, you know, do you, would you like, are you paying 45% tax? Would you like to pay 22%? Why don't you sign up for this scheme? Right? And it's taught too good to be true. But, you know, uh, so they've kind of withdrawn from that market because it's controversial, but I think it should be regulated and it's for the government to decide what it wants to do. I think it's decided, I might get this wrong, not to regulate this community, but to increase the, uh, the way in which they register people and so on and so forth, but I do think it should be a regulated community, yeah. Right, thank you. Um, another question that's, that's come in uh, from Anonymous um, is about um, uh, technological change and regulators responding to um, technical change and keeping yeah. pace with that. Yeah. Um, so I wondered w whether you could say a little bit about how that's manifesting in the, in the audit financial reporting area and what you would do about it. Well, look, this is a, a really fundamental question that we have to wrestle with over the next few years. So, so you can envisage a situation, can't you, where a company is using AI to process transactions or whatever, and the auditor is using AI to check the AI in the company. So you've got AI checking AI, right? And then we're the, we're the regulator. How do we understand how that works is something that we have discussed with the four, um, all of whom have multi-billion pound investment schemes in terms of technology because they think they can, there's a high level of automation to an audit. You know, that, that transactional part of the audit can be highly automated. And most of them are already taking really big strides down that route. And they think they can further automate the, the audit process. Um, so they're left with the big judgment questions, those we talked about uh, a minute ago. Do, do, do I worry about our capacity to compliance check AI, check in AI? Yeah, I do. I, do. <laughs> I don't know what the answer is, is the truth. Yeah. Um, but we have begun conversations with the audit firms about where are you really going with technology and how do we... How will, how will we get assurance that your deployment of new technology is meeting the standards that are necessary? And it's, it's an open conversation, but I don't have any solutions at this point. It's really difficult to see what the answer is. So I don't wanna, <laughs> I don't wanna deploy AI to compliance check the AI that's auditing the AI. That sort of sounds like, yeah. I don't know. So I can't, I can't get my head around it at the minute. Uh, but we know it's there and it will, it will it will increasingly become part of that, of the, in particular the big four, their processes will, they are putting massive investment into technology and they will strip people out of it in order to focus, focus people on the higher value elements of, of whatever it is that they do. So yeah, it's a bit of a worry. Don't know the answer to that question, but it's on my list to give my successor. Thank you. Um, let's see if there's any more questions in the room. Uh, there's uh, two hands up both near the back. Let's take both of them. Uh, hello, Ian Ronikers. Um, regulators are under a lot of pressure from the government at the moment to justify what they're doing to support economic growth and the competitiveness of the UK economy. Uh, is the FRC under any pressure to change anything in response to that agenda? Let's take the other question as well. Hi, uh, John Bell, FRC. Um, just going back to Arga, how do you reconcile your reference to light touch regulation? and potentially heavy enforcement powers against directors. Thank you. Great, thank you both. John. Uh, so a question about well, growth and a question about powers we, and light touch. We, uh, in, in relation to competition, the, the only market that we're really, we have any competition powers over are the, is the audit market. And the proposal is to give us more powers in relation to the audit market. Because there is a, a concern, uh, I think, across Parliament, and you mentioned it earlier, about the dominance of the big four. It's been slowly chipped away at, across the FTSE 350. But if you look at the FTSE 350, I think more than 90% of the audits are conducted by the big four. That's long been the situation in pretty much all capital markets across the world. That's the situation too, apart from France. We could talk about France if you want. Um, about why it's different, but, but let's not get distracted into that. So we, at the minute, chipping away at it, we brought forward some proposals about how you could diversify further the audit market, and ministers have approved all those policies to the point where they would legislate to give us additional powers, which they do not believe are anti-competitive in the slightest. 
because there's a concern about it's only a market of four. The real concern, if one might be transparent about it, is not, is not the general audit market, it's or the, the audit of financial services, which is highly specialised. It's fairly commonplace to say, well, I've got to rotate my auditor off. I've got two other firms doing tax and technology. That only leaves me with a choice of one. And it's, hot, you know, it's a, risky, a risky area for auditors to do. So there's some real concern that we, the FCA, the PRA, and the bank have about you know, financial services audit. That's the area. And ministers want more diversity, and they want, they want more, a more resilient market. So the powers we're being given, which might be um, somewhat controversial to some degree, actually ministers have said that these, are not, th these help us in the competition area because what they do is to raise standards in the UK and that makes us a more attractive place for people to invest in. That's the sort of logic of it. We're, we're under no pressure whatsoever to reduce regulation in that sense. Um, but we have to think very carefully about, for example, the corporate governance code changes that we've just recently uh, begun to consult, consult on. Actually, we're suggesting some pretty, pretty small changes to corporate governance code as opposed to a full-blown review and lots more. So we're, we're conscious of it, but we're not really under any great pressure. The, the dilemma between light touch and, and enforcement powers is, light touch is not my phrase. Um, we need to be clear, it's about, I, I suppose the way I think about it is like this, it's, it's all very well to say as a politician, I want light touch regulation, that doesn't really cost very much for the regulated community and so on and so forth. That's okay as long as the system works and everyone's responsible. But as I said in my remarks, that's not true. Uh, the vast majority of companies in the system that we regulate do behave, are responsible, are transparent, so on, but it's the exceptions to that. So you, you, can have a, you can have a differentiated light touch approach to the majority as long as they behave. But then the, pro the political problem you get is as soon as something collapses, everyone goes, well, what were you doing? And you say, well, uh, you know, my system had them in the, reg in the light touch group, and they go, well, you made a mistake. And it's just sort of like, you can't have both no failure no problem, and a light touch regulation system. That is, is my view. Unless you're prepared to give a regulator very invasive powers in very selective cases. But I can't, I can't get my head around whether Parliament would do that or not. So do you, do you want to give me powers to intervene in any list of company what, in whatever way I like? It's my judgment. Well, I want suspect the answer that's not. But I bet there are some parliamentarians who think, well, oh, somebody should have stopped Carillion from happening. You were the regulator. Why didn't you, you know, I, 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 well, what I'm, I suppose what I'm saying is, is I think it's quite difficult to reconcile the sort of political ambition for light touch with the reality that something at some point is going to fail. And you want to know what the regulator did about that failure, which is why I say you can't change the whole system. You need to have more invasive powers to the regulator. But that is in itself, Controversial, right? The more powers you give me, the more I'm likely to use them. Yeah. Want to do that? This is for, this is for parliamentarians and politicians to wrestle with. You know, I've got a view, but it's for them to decide. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to combine a couple of questions we've got online, um, both from uh, anonymous, which are sort of um, pulling on your your experience as a leader of an organisation, really. Um, okay. You've described some of the significant changes you've made to the leadership team in uh, the, the FRC. Um, how was the experience of re re revolutionising your ex-co and next level leadership team? How did you navigate the tensions and keep morale high and preserve stability? And related to that, somebody else is asking more generally, what advice would you give to a very small regulator with a limited budget and limited resources to prioritise reform and improving its operations? <laughs> Look, the leadership question is, is, is one that all leaders face. Do you have the leadership team which is right for the moment to take you forward into the next part of your journey as an organisation, right? And what seemed to me when I turned up was, you know, the executive committee as it existed at that point had been the executive committee which had led to Kingman. It's quite, I felt, you know, so I gave people six months to see what they were really like. It didn't seem to me that... The, the people who led the organisation to the place of Kingman would be the people who could take Kingman and turn it round into a different organisation. And so we had some straightforward conversations about how we would, you know, um, have a dignified exit for those people because they, were, they weren't the people who would turn the organisation around. And you just, you have to be 
upfront and polite and respectful and, and so on and so forth, but you, you, you can't duck the question of whether you've got the right leadership team for the journey ahead of you, right? And the, the thing about the wider leadership group, I always run something along the lines of a, a senior leadership team. So it's the, definitely the first level of the executive committee, most of the second level, if not, and then you add on a few other people to that, maybe network leaders and so on. And what you're trying to do is build a, a leadership coalition that's all pretty much in the same place about where are we trying to head. You know, HMRC at a top 100, uh, the FRC has a sort of top 40, and we sit and, uh, we sit, sit and talk about where are we going, what are we doing, what are the challenges, you know, you get people to come and showcase what they're doing and how they're stepping forward. People learn from that. It builds an incredibly strong network around the leadership team. About, you know, we're all roughly in the same place and heading in the right direction. But you have to, once you've bitten the bullet about the executive committee, then you then have to say, okay, are these are the next layer down also the people who are going to take us on the journey? And so we promoted some of our best up to the executive committee and indeed into the next level down. And we've also hired some people from the outside that we think would fit the, the journey. Of the front. You, you, you've got to do that when you're given the sort of challenges that I was given by Kingman and the Secretary of State, you know, tr fundamentally transform this. You can't fundamentally transform it with the same team, mm. yeah. is, is the reality, right? What's the second question? Yeah. Um, it was more general. If you, if you had a very small, small regulator... Look, where would you... uh, it's difficult for me to answer that question because I have the complete luxury of almost unlimited funding uh, because we're funded by a levy. And so I'm, we're, not, we're not civil servants, we're not in that regime, I'm not funded by the government, and so we have had some fairly aggressive increases in the levy in order to give us the capacity and capability necessary to do it. So I think we, when we started, I was, we were at 190 people when I started, and as I'm leaving, we're about 450. And the plan, if the government passes the legislation, Argo will need to have about 600. Uh, in order to do all the things that ministers want, and that's just the reality of it. Now, I think if we'd have been in the civil service system or we'd been publicly funded, I think the journey would probably would have been slower and there would have been more questions and all that kind of thing. But So I can't answer the question because I'm in the luxurious position of saying, well, I need some more money and I've got to be careful about what the increase is on the levy payers, but nevertheless, I, I need the resources. Sorry. Thank you. We're almost at the, at the end of time, so I just wanted to conclude by giving you... Uh, the opportunity to, I, I guess, of all the many things you've described that you've done, uh, tell us what you think was the biggest achievement of, of, of your time in the FRC. And also, <laughs> and also what, what advice you have for your successor? What, what do they need to focus on um, going forward? I'm not sure I'd pick out one, one moment. I think the, the, let's be upfront about it. Kingman was generous. His report was, could have been significantly worse, really. But as I said, once you've written 85 pages and you've got 83 recommendations, you sort of, and you're saying it's a ramshackle house, you are sort of saying it's broken. So turning that around into where we are now, I think, you know, in general, we're a credible regulator, we have a good reputation, uh, you know, we have great networks, we have good alliances, we've got a great team. That, that journey, I think, is, is really good. And the, my successor has to continue that journey a bit further forward. There are still some unresolved... Uh, issues and then there's a question about legislation. So we, we definitely need to get legislation to create Arga, the regulator. Um, we need investors to be more involved in corporate life. It's the kind of one regret in a way was we have shifted the dial a little bit about investors getting involved in corporate life and make and putting pressure on companies to raise standards and be more transparent and so on. But we haven't really cracked that area. So for me, those are probably the two key challenges for my success. It's been great fun. It's probably the the la this has been my last executive job and for, I don't know, the last seven or so it's been, here's a problem, the Ministry of Defence budget doesn't add up, can you sort that out, you know, can you transform the MOD, can you digitise the tax system, all that, it's been a great journey, I've, I've really enjoyed it, but uh, as you said, I'm going off to chair HS2, which might be interesting. <laughs> Indeed. Um, Unfortunately, we're out of time. We've got to leave it there. This has been fascinating, John. Thanks so much for, for, for coming in. And I hope that everybody in the audience and online has enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Um, my apologies to those with questions I didn't manage to get to you. Um, but for those in the room, do feel free to continue the conversation. There'll be refreshments on the landing um, afterwards. And do join us again for the next IFG Live event, which is uh, How is WhatsApp Changing Government? And that's tomorrow at 12.30. Details <laughs> on the website. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. And most importantly, please join me in thanking Sir John Thompson. Thank you.